let's turn to the uh, this AOC interview with David Zerota from earlier this month. Now, as we all know, AOC gives a very limited number of ish, uh, interviews to progressive progressives, <laughs> progressive yeah. media outlets. So have this you, was have you, have you asked her to come on your show and uh, not in a while. I, I did in the first year or so of this podcast, um, but I, I confess that I haven't even made the request probably in about a year. But maybe maybe I'll renew one. I'll, I'll renew I'll renew my request after we do this after we do okay. this episode. But in in the absence of having um, her here ourselves, let's parse through, I think, some of the juiciest, the most revealing, shall I say, parts of the interview with David Sirota. So speaking of that, and and I should mention, you know, our readers send in questions. A lot of these questions are an amalgam of, of their questions. The squad has been billed as a block of votes that hold the Democratic caucus and the Biden administration accountable and to create that boundary. At one point you had said, uh, and this I think is a quote, uh, in, in any other country, Joe Biden and I would not be in the same party, which I think is a commentary on a, the way our country's politics are set up. However, you, for instance, have voted 91 percent of the time with the Biden administration. That includes votes on the rail workers strike, uh, the spending, I think it was 40 billion dollars on the Ukraine war, uh, billions of dollars to microchip companies that have been criticized for using the cash to do buybacks. Uh, you and, and a group of progressives also didn't withhold your vote on the American Rescue Plan when the Biden administration kind of abandoned the minimum wage. So the question is, how can you hold your party accountable or create that boundary with the Biden administration when you and progressives in the Congress are oftentimes voting for what the party leadership wants and not or very rarely, sometimes, but rarely holding out your vote when the party really, really needs it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I want to address kind of two parts of that question. I'll, I'll get to some of those specific votes, uh, but I do want to emphasize that, you know, as, as you mentioned, there are times where we do break with the party. For example, on Build Back Better, that was a For sure. year long war. <laughs> for sure. That we had inside our party. And listen, there were moments where uh, in the lead up to that Build Back Better and bipartisan infrastructure vote where the president of the United States was on the speaker phone with us saying, you need to do this. And we said, how are you going to pat what, you know, the, the, the pretense that the president had on this is vote for Biff and trust me, I will get Build Back Better across the line. And right there with us facing the president, we're saying respectfully, um, it's this is not about, a, and, and the, the framing here to give a window into how internal politics, the internal politics of the party works, is do you trust us or not? Do you trust this leadership? And you have to tell this person, right? This is like, this is the, you know, Speaker Pelosi, President of the United States, the Vice President, you have members of the cabinet, and, um, and they use kind of like a collective environment. This is not a private conversation. They, it's almost like an invitation to try to say in front of everybody um, and, and that challenge. And it, to stand up to the Speaker and to the President and say this is not a matter of trust at all. This is a matter of votes. And it's not that I don't trust you, it's that I don't trust Joe Manchin. And I don't know if I trust anybody to be able to bring consistency out of a person who does not have any. Um, but all of that is to say is that I think that, that some of these votes also speak to that progressive infrastructure that we're talking about. This posture, so I think that David is asking a good question. He apparently took comments from his audience and so he, he put together questions that were based on what they wanted to know. How should people, what, what should people think about you and your ability to have a, a, an effect for the left and for working people in Congress when you are voting so frequently along with the president? AOC responds, well, let's focus on the times when I haven't voted with the president, like on Build Back Better. And it is true that they withheld their vote for some portion of the year and AOC and some of the squad members did object to the bifurcation of the bill saying outright that the only reason you would break something like this up into the infrastructure piece and the kind of um, social safety net piece or the social services piece is because you were trying to sink the latter and save the former. But ultimately, what ended up happening? So she responds respectfully, you know, she, she's, she's painting this picture 
of being asked personally by the president of the United States in a in a kind of an open meeting where she's being scrutinized, presumably by her colleagues as well. And the pressure, she's kind of being open about the pressure that she's feeling to go along with the president because of the posture of how this conversation is playing out. And she gets right up to the line of saying to David, you know, when Biden asks, do you trust me? She says respectfully, dot, 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 and then kind of changes what she was about to say and goes off in a different direction and ultimately comes back to saying, it's not that I don't trust you, I don't trust Manchin and cinema. What do you make of that? Uh. <laughs> I have to say that whole response that she gave uh, is a word salad. And anytime you see a political figure engaging in a word salad, it shows that they are, you know, it's it's a, it's an exercise in evasion, you know, the, you, you don't want to face the question really. And uh, I think the first, the, the, Firstly, the fact that she just, as you said, pivoted to the one time that, you know, for a period of time they had disagreed with Biden rather than actually responding to the question that he asked, which is actually look, look at all these. You know, I mean, I was actually surprised that Sirota listed all those uh, in, like, separate individual instances when the squad failed to stand up for working people uh, and she did not address any of those things initially and um and i think the whole thing the whole um, narrative that she presents in as you said it has some some uh, aspects of honesty there in in the sense that there is so much pressure on her and i think the the narrative that she's trying to put forward is not that she is denying that there is that pressure on her but in a way it's an appeal that whole word salad to me it was it was like an appeal for well, you have to excuse me for all these betrayals because that's how much pressure there is on me. You know, that's the, I think, the subtext of what she's trying to say, which is, of course, completely unacceptable. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it does feel like I, I, on a human level, understand emotionally the pressure that you're under, yeah. but you're basically admitting to us in the yeah. context of this interview that you don't feel the personal strength or you don't feel supported by or organizational strength or whatever it is to say to the president of the United States, no, I don't trust you. It's not just yeah. that I don't trust Manchin and Cinema. Yeah. You are a part either. of the problem because yeah. yeah. you also are enabling yeah. Manchin and Cinema, right? Yeah. Like this, you, yeah. you guys are all a part of a, um, you yeah. know, a party in a system that is not calling out what's going on with a rotating villain and who Biden very happily held behind hid behind rather the protection of the parliamentarian as he was yeah. tanking a $15 minimum wage and all of these kinds of things. Yeah. And, and we, yeah, yeah, that's the first time we even found out that there is a parliamentarian, such right. a, thing as a parliamentarian, which nobody knew. And suddenly right. the president of the United States, are you kidding me? The president of the United States does not have the power to overrule the parliamentarian. I mean, give me a break, right? I mean, such rank dishonesty, but I think you're, you're absolutely right. She is, she is uh, admitting that there is pressure on her um, to go along with Biden. But the way she's presenting it is as if she's seeking her our sympathy. Like, you know, you got right. to understand how it is. And yeah, it is. It is. We know it's hard. And I mean, it, again, you know, fundamentally, that's why I was saying that you can't discuss these things without also talking about the, you know, uh, uh, in, uh, inserting the question of the new party in it, because this is what happens when you are in the Democratic Party. They, they'll, they'll, they'll wear you down. Mm. They'll, you know, they'll basically emotionally and psychologically terrorize you into submission. Uh, and that, and I'm and I want to be clear. I'm saying this not to give um, AOC any, um, any mitigation, yeah, any yeah. cover or mitigate to mitigate her actions. But it's just, you know, that's the that's the reality of it. Yeah. When it comes to the real vote, for example, we worked very closely with all elements of the of um of the rail workers of, of rail workers both not just uh not just the teamsters not just uh some of some of the other formal unions but also those members of the unions that were rebelling against the initial round of these agreements um and it was in tandem with these organizations like when you look at for example rwu um and some of those folks that were leading the fight on opposing um, that initial agreement to to a terrible contract those were the folks that we were working with in developing our organizing strategy around this and it was in following you know the the actual rail workers lead both um, on both camps this was not just about choosing um traditional union leadership but also that rank and file grassroots leadership 
that we tried to determine our strategy, that we worked with Senator Sanders and we worked with uh, many others saying, how do you all want us to proceed? And that initial, the initial push was to rubber stamp this agreement with no attempt at, at, at getting paid leave. And procedurally, um, what we were asked to do by that rank and file is to get us a paid leave vote. That was the determination. That was the organizing leading up to that vote. That was the request that was made of me. And that is what I agreed to deliver on. Now, I think on the other end of that, there is a difference between the, this kind of like spontaneous digital response versus the actual organizing rooms and people that are, that are directly impacted by this. And when you look after the vote, folks like RWU were saying, this is what we asked them to do. Um, now, granted, I think that got drowned out by the noise of just people kind of operating more on 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 like the theory of the situation. Uh, but, you know, I think ultimately there there are moments where there are going to be internal disagreements about strategy. It is so important, especially among the left, that we develop a discernment between when there are differences in strategy, sometimes they are intense, and sometimes they, they are rigorous and vigorous disagreements versus um, equating that, that difference in strategy with somehow a, a 180 change in commitment to our vision and our principles. <laughs> Let's pass it over again. <laughs> All right. Um, so we obviously talked about this at length on another episode of Bad Faith uh, with Ryan Grimm. And you gave me one of the best uh, sound grabs that I've ever had on the podcast. By the way, I, I told you, I don't even remember saying it. Other people who watched it live said, you said this. And I'm like, wow, when did I say that? It was a betrayal. Sorry, what the actual fuck? Are, are you saying that those of us who are standing up for workers, we have the responsibility? You have the responsibility. Yes, you to, have to find a one, work, right. one worker. You have the, it was great. I programmed it into my soundboard for so I wanted to my call in shows. I can say, <laughs> periodically go what the actual fuck <laughs> but <laughs> I, so i don't want to go too much into the weeds here but as we discussed in that episode the paid leave vote was going to happen without the votes of the squad they had the votes already um to to, to get it get get the um senate vote on the paid leave and it's also one of these situations where even though there's going to be a vote on it we know which way the vote is going to go and in other instances aoc has said there's no point forcing the vote on an issue when it's going to get voted down. She said this with respect to the the force the vote yeah. moment over Medicare for all. Exactly. So what do you make about this uh, of this response that this is what the union wanted us to do? I think it is um, so problematic. It's actually quite stunning. First of all, just to parse through another round of word salad that she did, uh, you know, she she at one point, I, I believe, said something like, you know, the, she is uh, dismissive of what she calls spontaneous dig digital response versus the actual worker. So she she's trying to. Uh, she's trying to be she's be, she's being condescending towards the in a very defensive way. Obviously, she's on the defensive, she, condescending towards the uh, just critique and anger that was directed against her when uh, she and other members of the squad, excluding the Rashida Talib, voted for the strike-breaking bill. And so, you know, that's one one thing we have to point out that how, how um, I mean, how dare she just uh, dismiss ordinary people, millions of people who were absolutely livid. Like, you don't have to be a railroad worker to be livid about this because if you have any sense of how... Um, how it goes for the working class is that if any strike loses, it's actually bad for the working class as a whole. So we all have a stake in winning the strike. And we were just talking about that a little while ago, uh, about why it is important that Worker Strike Back is bringing up this question of how do you build that kind of solid unity that doesn't cross the picket line and stands with every strike action, uh, no matter which section of the working class and or which union it is. And so that in itself is a fundamental problem. But then uh, the bigger problem is um, the just the ball facedness with which she calls st a strike breaking vote as a difference in strategy. Yeah. Are you kidding me? Yeah. This is not a difference in strategy. This is a straight up betrayal of working people. And I think it's important that we know that I mean, it, 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 it was, you know, at the time it was a, it was a little unfortunate that it was unfortunate that 
the railroad workers united didn't make it clear that they or, or i think they i think they may have uh, they may have bought into this idea of two bill strategy whatever but uh, as socialist alternative pointed out from the very first moment this was a trojan horse this whole you know this whole uh, fanciful notion of oh let's get a vote on this and let's get a vote on the you know the, let's get a vote on the sick leave bill and let's get a vote on the ta bill and then that way maybe you can win i mean who are they kidding they, like you uh, already said they already had votes for the the ta which the workers had already rejected and um she uh, and, and and you know and, and the whole question of bringing these two bills that was complete dishonesty it was a as i said right. it was a trojan horse strategy they had, so, they yes, had already he, merged them right um jayapal had already you know championed her strategic victory in linking those two things together so to pass the ta they had to to pass the ta on to the senate they had to pass the uh, the vote on the uh, paid sick leaves. So we knew it was going to get to the Senate. We knew that already. So this like, this fiction that there weren't going to be enough votes without the squad's participation mm -hmm. and voting for this like, you know, constructive uh, vote down of their uh, ability to strike in order to get that second vote, which just fundamentally was wrong. And the idea that like they are the ones in the know and that the Twitterati that the these like Jewish journalists who aren't really savvy enough and who are just coming up with opinions online for no reason aren't smart enough to understand the actual dynamics of what happened is also I think so patronizing and frustrating. It's worth noting also, Sham. I'm not sure if you're aware of this. So Ron, uh, yeah, Kamen I was about Kao. to say that actually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ron Common Cow of the Railroad Workers United wrote a very important piece in Jacobin. I'm, I'm so glad that he wrote it because in, in that he makes it very clear that workers would never concede our right to strike. This is absolutely important that uh, the Railroad Workers United is making very clear. I, I you know, I genuinely am thankful for them to for, for making this very clear. And I think this harkens back to, remember when, when we were having this debate on your show with Ryan Grimm, he kept mentioning one of the railroad workers, member, railroad workers united member, and he kept asking me, "Do you know this person? Do you know this person?" And my response, as I recall, was, uh, "You know, I'm not quoting exactly, but you know, uh, paraphrasing that I don't need to know any specific worker. As a socialist, if you don't understand that you never ever vote to break a strike, then you are missing such a fundamental piece of what it means to stand up for the working class. You never vote to break a strike." You know, even if there is some confusion among the unions and some of them are advocating, which none of them were, by the way, but even if they were, you know, so it is so shameful for AOC, just utterly shameful for her to throw this back on the Railroad Workers United. And so that's why it's so crucial that they have, they have come out in favor, I mean, in, um, come out saying that, you know, we, we would never concede our right to strike. And then the other piece that AOC is completely lying about is, uh, or, or just, you know, lying by omission, let's say, is that uh, remember at that time even the section of the railroad workers you know there was a, a slim majority that had voted to reject the ta but then there were also many of the workers who maybe just were resigned and then they accepted the ta not that they were excited about it but remember it very crucially they said that if the other siblings of ours in the railroad unions go on strike we will go on strike with them we will not break the picket line right this is such an important component. So for her to come and say this or that section of the unions, and in fact, she said they were both asking. She said the ones who supported the TA and the ones opposing the TA, they both asked me to do this. This is this is just complete dishonesty. Yeah, I want to read just a little bit from Ron Kemenkow's uh, article in, in, in Jacobin entitled Railroad, uh, Rail Workers United, We Would Never Concede Our Right to Strike. He points out that on April 11th, Jacobin published a transcript of the interview that we're going through now uh, with David Sirota. Um, it says, in the context of a journal discussion about differences between the progressive wing of the Democratic Party and the Biden administration, the subject of the vote to break the strike of the railroad came up. In defending her votes, one to approve seven days of sick leave for rail workers and one to support the president's bill to block the strike, Ocasio-Cortez state that she was acting on the wishes of railroad, uh, railroad Workers United and other groups of railroad workers. She states in the interview, quote, when you look after the vote, folks like RWU were saying this is what we asked them to do. Later, she says, because, for example, with the rail vote, the only partners that I had leading up to that were rail workers. 
And if that's what they asked us to do, then that's what we did. But Ocasio-Cortez is clouding the reality of the situation by referring to the vote when, in fact, there were two separate and distinctive votes. One bill proposed seven days of paid sick time, while the other bill blocked rail workers from striking. These bills were completely independent of each other. Rail Workers United cannot speak with any certainty as to what the official position of various craft unions' respective leaderships was on the question of blocking the strike, but RWU made crystal clear by our words and actions throughout the contract negotiations that while we were, of course, in full support of seven days of paid sick leave for rail workers, RWU would never be in favor of any legislation denying rail workers our human right to withhold our labor when all else fails in our struggle for safe working conditions and dignity, regardless of whatever concessions may be dangled. Absolutely. It doesn't get more clear than that. No, no, I, I, it really doesn't. Hey, YouTube. Thanks for watching. Just a reminder that this is a podcast. You can catch an extra premium episode every Monday for $5 a month at patreon.com slash podcast. That's patreon.com slash podcast for $5 a month, an extra episode every week. Additionally, please do consider liking this video, subscribing to this channel. It helps us out. It helps independent media beat the algorithm. We appreciate you. And as always, keep the faith.